I'm Dr. Norma Braun, Chairman of the Archives Committee of the Mount Sinai St. Luke's Mount Sinai West System, um, part of formerly St. Luke's and Roosevelt. I'm here today to interview Dr. Sammy Hashem. Are you emeritus yet, or are you still professor of medicine? I wasn't sure, but anyway, uh, he's a very uh, productive physician who's been part of our family for, for many, many years. So, Sammy, I want to start with the beginning. Where were you born and where uh, you okay. were raised and did you have siblings and when you started your professional career? I was born in Lebanon, uh, 10 kilometers south of Beirut, a town called Damor. I don't know why they got that word, Amor, Damor. Anyway, I went to American University uh, of Beirut. Uh, at the time, they were calling me the Yankee because I had the American accent for some reason. <laughs> I'd gone to high school and American school also. And um, after that, there was a professor at the University of Buffalo visiting Lebanon, and he fixed me up to medical school at the University of Buffalo. There I did very well, apparently. The dean sponsored me to go to uh, Harvard hospitals for interview. And we told him, the hell with that, we want to stay in Buffalo. We didn't. We, two of us went in there, and I was interviewed at the Brigham, and uh, there was a whole series of ten people scaring the hell out of you. <laughs> Most of them had written textbooks of medicine and stuff like that. And uh, they asked me to check Professor Eppinger. He speaks perfect Arabic. And uh, he, I said, please, in Arabic. And he said, uh, how are you in, in Arabic? And I'm sorry, Professor Eppinger doesn't speak much Arabic because he addressed me as a woman. And it's not the right <laughs> way to address anybody. And so that you're an honest person. And uh, then just before me, they interviewed my friend, Jack Foley, and they asked him a simple question. Um, uh, what are the side effects of steroids? He had done his summer project on that, so he closed his eyes and repeated side effects of steroids. They asked me the same question half an hour later. And uh, I look at him, I said, sir, there are 32 side effects of steroids. You want me to start? And I looked at him, he said, no, 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 that's enough. <laughs> they took me and didn't take Jack. Anyway, uh, I did my internship, residency, and fellowship at the same place. In, the fellowship was the Department of Nutrition at Harvard. My first uh, publication was from there uh, on diluting uh, saturated fatty acids with unsaturated fatty acids, lowered the cholesterol. That was one of the early Were uh, New, you a England, resident? New England was Journal that, articles. As, as yeah. a resident? I, I was a fellow. As a fellow, okay. And uh, then as a fellow, um, I was still making rounds at the Brigham. Um, and Dr. Van Italy came. He was an attending physician uh, there at the Brigham. With, he came with a delegation from St. Luke's trying to enroll him as the new chief of medicine. Uh, and uh, he asked me to prepare two or three cases for him, which I did. And we presented them. They took him. A year later, I was here. This is the story of my life. Uh, so you connected with Dr. Van Italy then. and then I connected with him there. He decided to bring you with him when he came. He brought me a year later, yes. Uh, and so I've been here ever since, since 1958, as a, as a matter of fact. So um, at St. Luke's, I... Uh, went through various stages as seen in my CV. I don't want to repeat any of those things. Um, but my main dedication was research. Um, at the same time, I had a practice, so to speak, uh, in addition to my research. And uh, through that, I got to know the ambassadors of the Arab nations of the United Nations because I spoke their language all the United Nations, including Algeria, for example. 
I will never forget the story of the pre current president of Algeria. He was their uh, uh, ambassador to the United Nations, and the Kuwait ambassador asked me to come and see him at the world of Astoria. He was very sick. He had pain from here to here, and I figured he had a kidney stone. So I went back to St. Louis, got intravenous morphine, and shot him full of morphine, and he passed the stone. He still remembers it 40 years later. He's, he still sends me every year a case of Algerian wine. Is it any good? He's still the president of Algeria today. It's amazing. Was, anyway. the, was the wine good? <laughs> Algerian wine is very famous. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Very, very well. It's, it's after the French, uh, you know, it was a French colony for so many years. Uh, Bouteflika is a short man. And he was for independence against de Gaulle and all those people. When Algeria got its independence, um, he was asked to come and, and address the General Assembly, the Assemblée Générale of France. And he said to them, you don't think much of me, do you? You think I'm too short to be a gentleman. I want you to know that I'm one and a half inches taller than Napoleon. <laughs> They all did this. Clap. Clap. So that's so my story with the Arabs and the Kuwaitis. And uh, you, you remained that. I have those may, remained yeah. in relationship with Kuwait more than any of the others. Uh, and finally, you know, uh, Kuwait gave us a million dollars in 1980 and 14 million dollars two years or three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, that was very helpful. And now we're trying to get more money out of Kuwait, hopefully. Uh, uh, we'll see how that, how that happens. The development office is working on that. Now, at St. Luke's, I started research. I, I cannot tell you the amount of research I've done, but I made a summary of them here, which is included in my uh, other than just list of publications, but the contributions. And one of the main, uh, I think, uh, discoveries I made was medium chain triglyceride. Why is that? Apparently premature infants don't absorb fat. Their pancreatic lipase is not yet developed. And so their mother's fat, mother's milk fat, goes through. We introduced MCT into it and they absorbed it beautifully. And we had even sets of twins at St. Luke's at the time where one of the twins goes into my MCT and the other one goes into mother's milk or cow's milk and the one in MCT did far better so that they got out of the hospital. So today MCT is part of every goddamn infant formula on the world today. And so that's I think a major um, service to the preemie so to speak. It's also in most of the nutritional supplements you can buy over the counter. In that's sure, right. For example. That's right. Then we went on to, to discover cholesteramine, which was the first drug used for lowering cholesterol. It still is used in a lot of things. And uh, it's also used in relief of itching in biliary cirrhosis and stuff like that. Um, the, the other uh, thing was we used MCT to induce ketonemia which has great relevance today. It was 30 years ago. Um, and my collaborator with that was Dr. P. Sunier, and we published that by giving uh, normal volunteers a certain amount of MCT, let's say 30 to 50 grams as a single, and then we measured their ketone levels. Their ketone level to one to two, one to 1.5 millimolar. Um, that, um, became a tremendous boon, so much so that Axera company is marketing today MCT for treatment of Alzheimer's disease under the name of Axona, which is a prescription 20 grams twice a day, based on our work that it raises the ketones. Um, now, going back to the Brigham days, um, Dr. George Cahill, my mentor, at the time was studying starvation. And he discovered that 
Starvation raises the ketone levels to about 7 millimolar and stay at 7 millimolar until they die. And when I was at St. Luke's two years later, Bobby Sands in, uh, in British jail was on his 54th uh, starvation. Mentally, he was okay. Dr. Vanilli and I were called in to feed him intravenously. Uh, and we were ready to go, but he, he refused. Um, and he died, but his ketone levels were seven millimolar. So the discovery was that starvation brings it up to seven and it stays at seven. It doesn't go to ketoacidosis. Ketoacidosis is 25 to 30 millimolar. Okay. Then we discovered that in 1921, uh, Russell Wilder at Mayo Clinic treated uh, uh, children with epilepsy with, medium, with, uh, with uh, a ketogenic diet. When, uh, his ketogenic diet was 90% fat, zero carbohydrate, and 10% protein, or 92-8% protein. And uh, that was a beautiful 1921, you know. We don't know how much, how high the ketones went, but later on we discovered that it went to seven millimolar also. Then we emulated four years ago here at St. Luke's, the 1921 in patients with Parkinson's disease, you know, Parkinson's, and they got better. That was in collaboration with Dr. Ba Boss Bossman. Uh, Bresman. Bre 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 Bresman. Bresman at, uh, Beth Israel. Beth Israel. And uh, she did a beautiful job observing these cases and so on. So on a ketogenic diet, Parkinsonians got better. And we published that. Then I thought, the hell with that. Nobody is going to stick. Then I remembered Dr. Cahill's experiment. This woman weighs 300 pounds, and he said the only way for him to to have her lose weight is to starve her. He was studying starvation. And he knew that it went up to seven and stayed at seven and all that. She accepted. And she chose 40 days of starvation because Moses fasted 40 days. So did Jesus and all that. On the 40th day, we cannulated, he cannulated, I was helping him. Correct. The, the, an artery from here and the common juggler. You can't do this today. <laughs> and we discovered that the brain was using 150 grams of ketones a day. The blood sugar was 30, but she wasn't having any seizures. Then we did an experiment in dogs where we induced hypoglycemia in dogs and pre-infused them with ketone and they got okay too. So that stuck in my mind, therefore, there must be a better way of raising the ketones in the blood than starvation and ketogenic diet. I said, the hell with all that, I'm going to give them ketones. So I took beta hydroxybutyrate, 5% and drank it myself. And I was ready to draw blood, but I got sick. It, it burned my esophagus. It was too acidic. I was okay for a few days. Then I said, okay, I'm going to cure it. And I made it into a triglyceride, just like MCT. It's no longer acidic. And let our pancreatic lipase discharge them. So therefore, now, my ester is now before the FDA for approval. They approved it already in 2016, last year, as grass, generally recognized as safe by a panel of experts, all distinguished big professors from everywhere. And, uh, and so we're going ahead now uh, with the clinical trial. So that is my ultimate achievement, so to speak, all relating to lipid metabolism and uh, its derivatives. On medicine, I went um, to uh, an American school in Lebanon, a high school, and uh, I had two siblings who died mm -hmm. 
uh, early, um, ages five and six, something like that. One a, a boy and one a girl, my sister. And so I thought maybe I should do something. It was some silly stuff like diarrhea and, you know, things like that. Um, and uh, falciporum. Malaria. Malaria. Uh, one of them died of malaria, one of them died of diarrhea and so on. So I thought I want to do something. <laughs> that was probably uh, an infantile uh, hope to cure uh, those things. Um, well, the I got to the AUB after that from the American to the from Girard Institute to the American University, which was established in 1865. It's been around for a long time, and uh, over there I was going to do a PhD in biochemistry. I went through the master's degree in biochemistry there, and then the guy from Buffalo appeared and shunted me back to medicine. <laughs> As part of Master of Science, um, you, you, you have to take first year medicine in American University to oh. get an MS. So you have to take physiology, <laughs> biochemistry, and all that stuff. And, uh, and so that helped me a lot, the, the biochemistry part, which uh, I synthesized my own triglycerides, so no big deal to do that. So. Um, so that's how I got into this uh, medicine. Early on, I read an article by Rudolf Schoenheimer, 1935. Rudolf Schoenheimer was professor at Columbia of medicine and biochemistry, and he was the first to show unsaturated fats, lower cholesterol, 1935. I was very impressed with that. So I chose to go into nutrition as a subspecialty at the uh, Harvard, uh, you know, uh, school there. Um, then I built on Schoenheimer uh, other epidemiological studies showing again. Uh, and then I thought maybe I should do my own study, which I did on the first dilution of saturated fats with unsaturated fats and lowered cholesterol. That was an early finding, you know. The American diet at that time had, was mostly saturated fat, mostly. Especially um, uh, fats which are isomers of the real fats that our mayor forbade, remember? Uh, Bloomberg. Mayor Bloomberg stop them from being served in restaurants. Trans fats, they're called trans fats. So America was full of trans fats and saturated fats. And I was a little uh, helpful in showing that dilution of those fats with unsaturated fats, while you can still have the bad fats, uh, is, a, is a desirable thing. That was the beginning of many, many publications uh, over 250 publications on the subject of lipids, so uh, <laughs> I can recite them all. <laughs> so I know that that really drew you here, but what kept you here all this time? Because you were still very much a part of us. Well, what kept me here was uh, marrying a woman from Brooklyn. <laughs> 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 that was it, really. <laughs> uh, and we stayed in Brooklyn for a while while I was at St. Luke's, so, <laughs> yeah, that was convenient. She had a big house in Brooklyn and all this. I had no house. <laughs> Is she a medical person too? No, no, she, uh, she was English literature major <laughs> and uh, helped me a lot and she typed all my publications, every one of them. I told Van Italy, he owes me so much money for being for having her as my secretary for so many years. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure. And did you have children? Yeah, she she was a good typist. All this is her typing. Yeah. Still? No, no, that stopped <laughs> because she died on me a few years ago, two years ago. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. How many children did you have? I have two children, uh, a boy and a girl, and five grandchildren. Oh, 
Oh, God bless. That's wonderful. Wonderful. What keeps you coming? What keeps you engaged? You know, it's funny. I, uh, certainly the money doesn't keep you coming. That's for not sure. Either. No, not anymore. Um, it's, it's the interest. My discovery of the ketone and neurodegenerative disease happened only in the last year or two. I mean, right here. Uh, while I was not on the official payroll, <laughs> so to speak, I was on my own. Uh, but coming here, there, uh, Mount Sinai was uh, very nice to me and um, appointed me. Uh, having been an emeritus professor, I didn't need to have any professorship anymore. It's enough. Um, so that was, that was very nice. Um, right now, we are working hard to see if we can get more money out of Kuwait for uh, Mount Sinai St. Luke's. Uh, is the next, that's one of my remaining jobs. <laughs> Were there other people with whom you worked, either here or at other, from other institutions on, on these interests? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, we work very hard with the uh, uh, the staff at the Department of Nutrition at Harvard for about three or four years, and we had some common publications with them, uh, and Van Italy as, as well. Um, and then uh, I contacted, you know, I'll tell you a funny story about that, others. Um, Dr. Davis, the Chief Officer of Mount Sinai Health, Kenneth Davis, wrote me a letter 20 years ago, wanting, he was studying uh, Alzheimer's disease with uh, some drug, and he wanted Kuwaitis to put, uh, Kuwaiti patients, he wanted me to enroll Kuwaiti patients for him uh, to participate in this, in this study. And I did, you know, was, I knew the head of uh, the health department of Kuwait, I knew the prime minister, I knew the ruler, I knew the whole works, they, they were helpful. So I dug up that letter about three months ago and I sent it to him. <laughs> <laughs> Since then we've been friends. <laughs> he, did, he, he had forgotten that he did that, yeah. Yeah, so that was a collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> A, a premature collaboration with Mount Sinai. <laughs> Did it come to any fruition? Oh study? yes, he published on it and all that. But you see, Alzheimer's has been very, uh, it's a very different disorder of all of them. And people think these uh, amyloid plaques are causing the disease, but you can have plaques and still have no disease. Correct. So most of the drugs the latest monoclonal antibodies are to dissolve those plaques, and they didn't. Doesn't so, work. Didn't work. No. I hope mine will work. We'll see. Well, it's very. I think it's very complicated in terms of how does the brain cell maintain its integrity and its healthy life, and I don't think we know the answer. We don't to know that the answer at all. No. And I think we do the brain know one little thing about the brain cells. They exclusively live on glucose. Correct. Uh, whereas the heart can use muscle, or can use uh, protein and fat, but not the brain. However, as we grow older, we seem to have diminution in utilization of glucose by the brain. I called it type three diabetes and wrote an article on it and the editor said, somebody beat you to it. A uh, professor from Brown University th thought that Alzheimer's type 3 diabetes, only up here, but not here. Mm -hmm. um, so diminution of relation glucose, but it does not lose its ability to use ketones. That was the whole idea behind the ketonemia, behind starvation, improving mental function, and uh, 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 ketogenic diet improving mental function, and hopefully therapeutic ketosis, I call it or physiologic ketosis, maximum seven millimolar, three, four, five, seven millimolar. The MCT that's on the market today raises it to from 0.3 to 0.7 millimolar, not enough for the brain. 
So the brain in Alzheimer's disease still can use ketones. That's the idea that, that we are proposing. Is the reduced glucose utilization corrected for brain volume? Because that decreases with age. Right, energy, it, the, the energy requirement is replenished, so to speak, mm -hmm. by ketone. Mainly beta-hydroxybutyrate, by the way. Then the brain changes it to acetoacetate to enter the Krebs cycle. So it's a separate mitochondrial function that uses right. ketones when glucose is not available. Well, to, that means you're continue to be excited because this is ongoing work. I, I do know that you are one of the favorite lecturers for the house staff. Oh yeah, <laughs> they they love to hear you talk about lipids because you put it to them a complex to them biochemical processes in a way that they understand it. So, how often do you wind up doing that, and is that part of the fun? Yeah. Uh, actually, the chief resident asked me to repeat the keto. I said, no, no, let me talk to you about something else this year. I'm going to talk to you about ketones. She said, wonderful. <laughs> I think I want to introduce that because they don't know anything about it. No, know, no, they, it's, it's separate from their basic curriculum, too. Yeah, yeah. And until it hits the big time, namely, quote, in the guidelines, it will not have much uh, emphasis in their curriculum. That's right. Because everything is now guidelines, if it's within the guidelines, and then of course they want to pass their boards, so, which is <laughs> another thing. Until it's in the boards, it's not going to be uh, given much prime That's time, right. w w which is part of the problem. Um, how have you integrated your professional life with your family life and raising a family and so on, and uh, what are your other interests, hobbies? Well, I... Uh I became a photographer, so to speak, and I photographed everything. <laughs> and one of my photographs won the first prize at the Columbia St. Louis competition in oh. uh, 1975. It was the first prize. I, well, I couldn't believe it. What was the subject? It was, you know, Eisenstadt, the famous Times Square kiss. And World War II, mm -hmm. Eisenstadt, he was mm -hmm. my patient. Oh. Eisenstadt was my patient. And he told me, you have a camera, right? Let me see it. I said, he said, you bring this lens and you get close-ups and you will be a champion. And it was. That was it. I was taught by Eisenstadt. It's amazing. Yeah. This one is a, I call it September magnolia. The magnolia is early flower, right? Right. Very and then beautiful. later in September, it becomes like the head of a bird, and I, I caught it split with a brilliant red seed inside. Mm -hmm. That's the birth of magnolia, I call beautiful. it. Beautiful. It won the first prize. Yeah, well, and I've been doing photography like crazy. I was in Europe uh, not long ago, and brought back the best camera there is, and I it was a present from one of people I know, one of my friends. I can't use it. It's too complicated. No, I use this thing. <laughs> it's a simple one. A simple one. <laughs> well, I think many people have picked up on the simple one. Yeah, yeah. Maybe Brian can teach us about the more complicated ones. Because that's what the pros use, is that correct? Absolutely. So these, uh, I've had patients from Saudi Arabia. I've gone to... Qatar, um, Qatar now today is the news, you know. I know. Um, 20 years ago, I was in Qatar treating Princess Jafla. She, <laughs> she had acute pancreatitis with slight diabetes, sometimes associated with that, you know. We took care of her, and uh, now her niece is, lives in New York, and uh, it's amazing. Uh, she was the head of the uh, museum in Qatar, built by Pai. You know Pai the Pei? Yes. Or pa Pei. 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 Yeah, very famous architect. Very famous architect. He built the, her the museum. She's a graduate of Duke University. She's mm -hmm. a young lady from, a princess from Qatar, Sheikha. Anyway, one of our attendings 
he has a Japanese name, Vermjutsu, radiologist. He told me, I'm going to see Mayasa. I said, who, Mayasa? <laughs> She's here attending the birthday of Pei. Uh -huh. And Pei is 100 years old today, T next week. I said, please invite me. I want to go and see her. <laughs> She's the one who bought the most expensive painting in the history of art. The uh, Roosevelt merger, actually, I had a little bit to do with it, a little bit, just background, uh, sort of gossip and enthusiasm for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was really Van Ellis doing, mostly, you know, and he would confide with me what they were doing and what they were thinking and all that. But that wasn't that important to me because the important was, you know, the work. The work. So we had no problem with that uh, at all. Uh, and uh, there was a time when I made rounds at Roosevelt in endocrine as well as here. So that was very nice. Uh, now the Mount Sinai thing came and they kept me as an attending here. Uh, a non-paid attending, what they call... Uh, volunteer. Volunteer, yeah. Um, that was very nice. That was, gave me a little office, which was my old office for 45 years. Uh, and it's still there. Uh, that's all I need, really, uh, to finish what I am up to right now. You're still working with Dr. Van Dilley as well, and he's still active. Yes, he and I are writing a new paper together right now. He, you were, you of course, saw him a couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, and um, he's amazing, an amazing guy. He, yep. He. Uh, Do you think both of you have had an impact from your own research in your longevity and productivity? <laughs> Perhaps, maybe I. I I have no idea. I'm beginning to think it's all genetics. Uh, I've seen very obese people live a long time. Churchill is one of them. <laughs> and he smoked cigars and, and drank brandy every day. So. <laughs> and very thin people not, not living that long. Um, but it helps. Uh, uh, still heart disease is number one here and cancer number two. Uh, lungs number three. Lungs number three. So. Uh, you know, we don't know the future. I read a recent article, the genetics are going to go into it now. The genome used to cost $100,000. Now it costs $700 for your entire genome. Right. And they will find some variant in your genes that will tell you you're going to get Parkinson's disease or something else. Um, that you might get Parkinson's you might. disease. Yeah, that's yes. the problem. We still don't know how genes are expressed. Sometimes they merge and neutralize each other. God knows how. But anyway, that's going to be the future in medicine. Um, I noticed Mount Sinai's uh, booklet, The Future of Medicine. It's genomics. It is genomics and everything, and cancer, and cancer treatment as well. So all those things are happening because we're beginning to understand how better how cells replicate and how they go awry. I know that the past week uh, at ALS conference, you know, they now have 55 genes yep. that accounts for ALS, which in the past we thought there were three. So things are exponentially increasing. Is, is that what keeps you alive, keeps you going? Yes, in a way. Uh, and one also interesting part is their children and grandchildren. Uh, he has to stick around until they're old enough to uh, realize that death is inevitable. <laughs> so I, I see it. <laughs> well, that's for sure. That's the one thing we can count on. We, we don't even have to pay taxes. But you do, everyone will die at some time. And the hard part is knowing yeah. uh, when and as my little daughter said once when she discovered that she wasn't in my wedding album pictures and yet her cousins were. <laughs> so she was very angry when she demanded, why wasn't I invited to your wedding? <laughs> and when I told her it was because she wasn't, 
the the, uh, the concept of not being not being prior that there was a whole world before she lived was yeah. like a concept for a five year old that was beyond her ability to comprehend. Amazing. But she, I could see her little brain working. You know, how could there be something before me? Because <laughs> the world started with me, and. As a child, that's what you wind up learning, isn't it? That the world doesn't start with you, and that maybe there's more out there to find out about. You know, the funny it. part about this is that when you and I went to see Van Italy, I noticed in the kitchen a whole slew of bottles. And I look at those bottles. Every goddamn vitamin in the book is in there. Uh, I don't do that, but apparently he does. I yeah. didn't ask him any question about that. but. Right. Interesting. Uh, well, the belief system. Yeah. That we want to do things that might help us, even if there isn't evidence, as long as it doesn't do a lot of harm. And sometimes it does a lot of harm, exactly. Well, it can do harm because, uh, in the one hand, there's the vitamin D deficiency in the population. On the other hand, there are people taking excessive doses. So, you know, a, a little is good, but a lot may be harmful. And Remember Linus Spalling, who. Oh, yes. Very he much. was pushing vitamin C in grams. 70 grams a day. day. Yeah. Linus Pauling, I was on an NIH committee uh, evaluating grants, and I was assigned to review Linus Pauling's grant request, NIH. And I kind of, 70 grams. Of, uh, another member of the committee said, well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to approve this. I said, why? Let him do it. This man has two Nobel Prizes. Two, not one. Like Madame Curie had two. Finally, we approved him. But 70 grams didn't do anything. No, it didn't. It produced kidney stones <laughs> later. <laughs> but it was good to find out. <laughs> that that wasn't the route to go. He he was strongly believed its antioxidant properties are what would keep his brain young. Yeah. And he didn't think that, uh, he didn't know enough then about the... Uh, the first Nobel metabolism. Prize he got was for the nature of the chemical bond. That was his book. And the second one was at the United Nations where he chained himself against the Korean War or Vietnam. I don't yeah. know which for one. For peace, yeah. Yeah, for peace. And Madame Curie got it for peace also. And, of course, radioactivity. Right, yeah, exactly, exactly. And we're going to try to interview Dr. Ennis because he is a staunch um, admirer of Dr. Abe, who is the first physician in the United States to use radiation for treating cancer. Oh, yeah. And it was at the Roosevelt site at the time. And he had actually gotten uh, Madame Curie to help him set that up for the first first treatment. Was her husband involved? Apparently not. No. Apparently not. We we have pictures of Madame Curie from that 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 time when she was consulting with Dr. Abbe. So we will uh, include that in in future series. W did either of your children go into medicine? Either? Either, either of your children d go into medicine? Oh, no, no. Uh, my daughter is uh, married to uh, uh, a veterinarian, and they have their own hospital in Dobbs Ferry. Oh, they went into animal medicine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my, And she's in charge of the, of, the, uh, of the operation there. And my son is vice president of MetLife. Oh, my goodness. The business guy. And he makes sure I, I live. <laughs> that you're covered. <laughs> covered. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. about it. Yeah. Well, what advice would you give to someone now by going into medicine? Would you? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted him to go into medicine, but he didn't want it. You know, it's, 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 it's. My daughter was more amenable to medicine, but she chose veterinary medicine association rather than the actual thing. Um, her husband <coughs> discovered a new species of snake. Oh, wow. That was very nice and published. <laughs> That's interesting. I, 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 he wanted me to be a co-author. I said, no, no, no. <laughs> I can't possibly <laughs> be fooling around with snakes. At least not then. 
Well, who knows? Maybe the metabolism of a snake would help us know a little bit more about. I know, I know. I just discovered something in Science Magazine, which I get. Um, the orang orangutan uh, in Borneo, the baby nurses for eight years. I figured, how much does it live? They don't tell you. <laughs> He's weaned. And they got it to know from the deciduous teeth. <laughs> they were eight years old. <laughs> wow, wow. It's amazing. I mean, I have, suppose they live 15 and they nurse for eight? That poor mother is... Uh, <laughs> exhausted. <laughs> exhausted. Well, it doesn't keep her from having more orangutans. <laughs> just nursing is, inhibits uh, ovulation. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So the question is, well, how does the species perpetuate them? <laughs> That's why they're an <laughs> the endangered species. <laughs> oh, the, I think they're in danger because they're habitat. They have big eyes, I noticed. Yeah. They have a picture. Uh, uh, they, are, they are. How do you do it? Orang Orangutan. 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 <laughs> so your interests are wide and still quite Yes. Incredible. Yeah, very much so. Is there anything else you'd like to add to anything about yourself and your relationships, etc., cetera, um, with the, your long career? No, I'd like to continue my enthusiasm for St. Luke's through the connection to Mount Sinai. That's the last thing I will do, I think. Um, I, I'm reasonably confident we get more money um, uh, from Kuwait, the idea is to transmit what you're doing here to Kuwait, because they have an Arrhythmia Institute in Kuwait also, in the name of Al-Sabah. So that when you're doing a patient here, the technology allows them to look at it, right. and vice versa. That's going to cost maybe four or five million, I don't know yet, dollars, to get the equipment to transmit uh, this is an that's idea. Protected. Of, that's protected. That's protected. This is an idea of mine, really, and I uh, and 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 the development office likes it, and they checked with Dr. Davis on that. That is okay. Uh, I don't know if it will succeed or not, but uh, and I want to bring the arrhythmia guy over here, and vice versa. Uh, Dr. Meta, for example, can go there. So there'll be an exchange. Exchange, yeah. But the technology is, is they tell me, is, is available. Yeah, it's I, I don't available. know. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, it's available. Uh, how about your Libet research in terms of collaborators around the world? Well, the, the, the Libet research, I have two ideas. One, I published a new fat, non caloric fat. It's a polysilicon. Mm. That's published. And then the breast killed me, killed it. What does that mean? The breast yeah. killed it. Tell me. Breast transplant. Ah. Had keto, had... Uh, silicone. Silicone. And they thought it was causing cancer. That stopped. Ten years later, it doesn't cause cancer. So I go back to the lipid idea of having a fat, beautiful frying, Characteristics. We run it to 1,200 degrees, and it's still not smoking too much. And uh, it's, it's like grapeseed oil. Yeah, only it's zero calories. We put rats on it; they lost weight like crazy, and all that. That was very nice. I want to go back to that if I can. So you're gonna to go to a. I uh, have three or four other ideas. Uh, I have one idea about um, uh, asthma, your area. It's a funny thing. A study in rats took two groups of rats. Not my study, somebody yeah, else's yeah. study. Littermates. One of them was uh, soluble fiber. One was insoluble fiber. Fiber. The asthmatic, they're both asthmatics. The asthmatic model on the soluble fiber got better. Their asthma got better. What the hell is that? What's the difference between soluble and insoluble fiber? The soluble fiber, the bacteria in the intestine, changes it to short-chain fatty acids, back to my fat. 
And so what did they do? On the soluble fiber, they discovered butyric acid. Oh. So they took butyric acid and infused it into the rat without the soluble fiber, and that improved its asthma too. What did I do? I took butyric acid, this time very carefully, and I drank it, but it was acidic. Mm, huh? Still acidic. Same story. I made it into a triglyceride for asthma. <laughs> I don't know if this works. It's going to work yet, <laughs> yet. Oh, it's too far down. <laughs> you mean nobody's putting it in clinical trials? Yet. And I'm calling it tributyrin. Uh -huh. And it, it, it uh, what the hell is it? Maybe you should try it <laughs> on your patients. <laughs> yeah, well, we have a group of patients who are very uh, resistant to, to standard therapies. And we're now using uh, different classes of monoclonal antibodies to try to find out which limb of the inflammatory pathway we can block. So that's a very costly, a very uh, invasive method because it has to be given parenterally. So it's not, not really an easy thing to do. And not only is it not easy to do, is getting insurance to cover it has been another issue. So You know, the, the one for Alzheimer's and, and uh, neurodegenerative diseases is also butyric acid, but hydroxybutyric. Yes. Right. This is just butyric, not hydroxy. And uh, what is amazing, I know from other works, uh, is that ruminant animals are full of butyric acid and propionic acid. This is their main source of energy after it goes through the digestive process and on eating grass and stuff like that ends up in butyric acid. Uh, I don't know, it's another idea. I have five other ideas, which we'll, we'll see before I go. <laughs> well, Dr. Roland, uh, Louis P. Roland, uh, just died recently this year. Oh, yeah. And uh, he was 92. And he was at his office the day before he died, working still. So I suspect that people like yourself and Dr. Van Lee really to not work is to die, and to work is to be alive. Absolutely. That's, it, amen. Yes, yes. And, uh, it's, it's amazing how I enjoy coming here. I drive here and so on. Um, I have a place to park in the garage, <laughs> which is nice. <laughs> I don't have to look for it. It helps. <laughs> it helps. It helps. Uh, it helps a lot because <laughs> otherwise it's frustrating. Yep. Uh, and uh, I keep seeing all friends, you know, uh, and I still visit Van Italy once in a while, I mean, once a month or so, because we're still uh, writing things together. Uh, Van Italy thinks of my invention as one of the greatest of all time, which I don't think that's the right thing to say, but that's what well, I think. Well, I mean, it's, it's a beginning at least till you get the clinical trials to show how, whether it works. Yeah. Because it would be a tremendous boon given so many, the in, rate of Alzheimer's increased dramatically. You know, I made one ounce of it myself, and then what the hell, how am I, what am I gonna get tons of it? And so I saw an article about fat metabolism, and they made a similar compound, not the same, similar, and it was for intravenous nutrition. MD, 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 PhD. I said, this is the guy who made it for them. I found him. He turned out to be the head of research at Eastman Chemical Company in oh. Tennessee. I called him. I said, do you make triglyceride or beta hydroxybutyric acid? He said, how many tons do you need? <laughs> there you go. Now you have a source. Whereupon, he invited me to come down. I gave a talk down there. He paid my way in a hotel and all that. He gave me an honorarium. And they were so interested. They're still interested. They're our supplier. Oh. I can't. I can't. But I can't. You don't have a factory. I don't have the, where, where am I going to? So they probably end up owning the whole thing anyway. So we'll see. As long as you have your rights, because what we need to do is shift that into research. Yeah. Because yeah. that, that's where we need the resources. So that, that's the last question I think I have, is, is how were you able to maintain your funding for all the work that you did? Because that's another component that's necessary to move the, 
the work forward. Yes, it's amazing. Uh, I was reading uh, something about the French, uh, Claude Bernard and all those people, and what a what an inspiration to read something about their lives and, and how they came out with these tremendous ideas right. to change history, um, including some Russians too. Right. Well, part of it to me was, uh, number one, they were all trained in the classics first. And subsequent to that, there was collegiality, which meant interaction with other people, which is a stimulation to thinking, I, I believe. Uh, and my concern now is that whether our lack of connectedness is actually going to depress this stimulation that comes from interaction with people and their ability to think. Because robots are only as good as you put in the information. I'm not yes. sure they're capable of new ideas, formulating new concepts, formulating uh, exciting uh, questions to be than to be acted upon for testing at this point in time. Amazing how, uh, um, I saw an article the other day in Science, I counted them. There were 55 authors. Oh, it's said, how, how do they get together like this, you know? Online. Uh, uh, it must be, you know? And they, half a page was each one what they do. <laughs> well, how would they contribute to this work? Well, they have to present that now as part of the condition for the manuscript being even reviewed. Because a lot of people used to add their names, which they didn't do. I mean, I had that experience when I was doing my research, that the chair of the department asked me to put his name on it. And that's a very big conflict, because when the chair asks you, and you're a junior faculty member, how do you say no? when they didn't do anything to either the, uh, any component of the yeah. work that was done. Except no, but they explained each one's role. Well, that's what's necessary now. It's really important that That's case. what you call cooperation. <laughs> yep, that is cooperation. Uh -huh. But then they advance their CVs, right? Expand their CVs. The old stuff is Eureka. Eureka, right? You saw something yep. alone. Nobody else was with you on it. You're alone. That was the concept of a uh, Nobel Prize. Right. But now, it's cooperation. Right. Because one thing generates another, like a pyramidal effect. So I'm still cooperating with Van Italy. <laughs> that's good. That, that's very, very good. Is there anything else you'd like to add? To tell, tell us about yourself or someone special. Um, no, I uh, have visited uh, Lebanon and have become visiting professor at the AUB, which was very, not very nice. But since then, I've been bombarded with <laughs> requests for funds. Oh, yes, <laughs> yes. Which is the usual thing, anyway. Right, right. For right. years, they hadn't bothered with me, but now they seem to. The same thing with the Brigham. I went to a reunion, and now I ended up with a necktie <laughs> and bombardments. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, I, 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 I can understand that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wilhelmor Stephenson was, uh, lived for 30, 40 years with the Eskimos in northern Canada. And he, in 1955, when the Nautilus reached the North Pole, he told them how the Nautilus should come up to the North Pole. He knew the direction he led, and he spoke to President Eisenhower at the time. So that was Stephenson. Stephenson uh, loved meat. And we, Department of Nutrition at, at Harvard, you know, were down. <laughs> yeah. So he told us very fascinating stories about his, uh, his time in the Arctic. He was emeritus professor at Dartmouth at that. He collected like 100,000 books a lot of them on the Arctic, and he donated it to, he showed us his uh, thing. He, one of his uh, stories is that they got a Middle East sheep in the Arctic. That was, he was part of the Harvard expedition 1905. Oh, wow. I mean, the man was 88 years old at the time when he saw him. 
And he had written a book, The Friendly Arctic, which he signed for me as a bird, which I still have. So we went to dinner and we all ordered steak because he ordered steak. We could, uh, and we were all busy cutting our fat off the steak. And he was doing this, looking at us. He <laughs> said, are you finished? Yes, sir. Well, not yet. He collected our fat and ate it. Ooh. I, the junior member of the group, said, sir, how old are you? He told me, 87, 88. How old was your father when he died? He said, my father? He's still alive. What? How about your mother? She's alive too, in Iceland. Ah. Oh. He had come from Iceland. She was 110, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and they asked me then to draw blood from him. So help me, his blood was creamy. I bet. And when we centrifuged it, he had the calomicrons on top. That was the story of Wilhelm Orr Stephenson. And, and, and Is terrific. that why you went to see him? And that was on that front. I went with them to, to see his book, uh, The Friendly Arctic, and he had another book on diet. Mm -hmm. And uh, he liked to have a fat, rich diet. Right. I said, you're not going to live to be 110, sir. He was going to look at his blood. He died a year later. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Cardiac death, I assume, yeah. Yeah, or a yeah. stroke. Yeah, right. Wilhelm or Stephenson. But he still lived a long I time. I think I should uh, bring his book and put it in the archives, because it's part of the story, you know? What do you think? Well, I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because he signed it for me. Oh, well, we'll, we'll add it to the, your profile. He's a, he was quite a guy. His wife, like 30 years younger. <laughs> I don't know if she's still alive. <laughs> could be, could be. Is that his first wife or his other? Did you see the French uh, president? Oh, yes. He prefers older women. <laughs> There's something to that. He's 39, she's 64. Yep, she was his teacher in grade his, school. His teacher. He uh -huh. fell with her, with her then, and he told her when he left grade school they were going to marry her, and she thought, a oh, child. All, all kids fall in love with their teachers, right? At yeah. some point, right? Yeah. But he pursued her. He, he wouldn't let up. And he continued and continued and continued. Then he succeeded. That tells you maybe how he rose to his position relatively quickly. He was premature to start with, right? <laughs> in terms of her pursuit of his goals. You know, with our interest in the lipids, I must uh, mention that uh, I took care of the lipids for like 10 t members of trustees of oh. St. Luke's, at least 10. Uh, Are you doing Ken Davis? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can't disclose it. It's amazing how that damn cholesterol has is, is gotten us to more patients. Uh, it's amazing. Well, it's, it's a big factor and nobody wants to die young. Uh, they'd rather not die old either. I think uh, not becoming inept, losing your faculties is probably more important than just how long you live. And so I think that's the fear that many people have as they're growing older, that they'll lose their ability to function in their brains, their mental capacity. Yeah. And that's a frightening place to be. I know when, I, when patients worry about uh, their Alzheimer's, and since we don't have a good, really good treatment except for healthy behavior and good genes, I always tell them, <laughs> if you're asking me the question, you don't have it. Because if you have it, you don't know it <laughs> as a way to uh, reduce the anxiety because right now we can't do much That's about a good it. one. That's a good one. You know, um, I must tell you that we also work on the lung with Dr. Torino. Tori no, before Torino. Oh, before, before Torino. Who was before Torino? Rod Barrett. Oh, Rod Barrett, yeah. And uh, the pathology guy. Um, Stephen Ryan. Ryan. 
We identified the surfactant of the lung. We have four papers on that. And I was just the, the chemical part of it. It's uh, a phospholipid. Yeah. I was doing chromatography and so on mm -hmm. um, of the lipids of the lung. Dipalmitoolein. <laughs> it was really very important. It was my introduction to the yeah. lung. That's yeah. about it. <laughs> it's obviously being extensively used in prematures. And even in some other cases that... Uh, and I like it. this article to be part of the record uh, uh, because it my summarizes okay. uh, I, 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 I will be happy to uh, have it included. I'll give it to our archivist uh, for sure. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Sammy A. Hashem, attending physician, senior attending physician, uh, Mount Sinai, St. Luke's, Roosevelt.